You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. It is a dangerous world out there. Volatility is on the rise, and your clients' portfolios are under assault from a growing number of threats. Simple diversification is no longer enough to shield the assets under your protection. Registered investment advisors, financial planners, and asset managers need a new weapon in their war on risk. Welcome Welcome to to the the Advisor's Advisor's Option, Option. the program designed to arm busy advisors with the information necessary to properly manage risk in this volatile environment. From options education, trading strategies and tips, to industry news and interviews, you'll find it all on the Advisor's Option. The Advisor's Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop options strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end option strategy development making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning, options data, including dividends and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. And now, it's time to learn how to implement options in your practice. It's time for the The Advisor's advisor's option. Option. All right, everybody, that music can mean only one thing. It is time once again for the Advisors Option, the program here on the Options Insider Radio Network. We break down the sometimes scary, sometimes seemingly impenetrable world of options for you, the busy financial advisor or asset manager, because guess what? You're busy out there actually dealing with your clients day to day, so maybe you don't have time to pay attention to these markets full time. That's okay. We've got you covered. We'll do it for you here on the Advisors Option. My name is Mark Longo from the OptionsInsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever insightful, at least we hope so, Options Insider Radio Network. Reminding all of you out there, remember, wherever you get this content, there's so many new people joining the world of options these days. It really is important for them to have a place to turn a lighthouse in these stormy market seas. So keep rating and reviewing this content wherever you get it. I saw it's up on Audible now. It's on pretty much every platform you could possibly think of, which, by the way, is a little intimidating to see your shows up there alongside the great classics of literature. But there you go. There's no place really you can't find our network content. So keep rating and reviewing it out there. It really does help new folks discover all the legion of shows we do here on the network. Of course, keep those questions and comments coming, too. We do love to hear from all of you folks out there. And let's see who we're hearing from. On the advisor's option today, first, I'm pleased to say we're joined once again by my compatriot, a.k.a. the Oracle of New Hampshire, a.k.a. the founder of Orex, a.k.a. Options Research and Technology Services, Mr. Matt Amberson. Matt, welcome back to the advisor's option, sir. 
Crime and punishment followed by the option insider radio <laughs> network advisor option. I like it, Mark. I like it. I think that's a good mix. You know, you get some nice, dense literature in, then you take a bit of a respite with us, and then you dive back in. I like that. That's a good mix. I think that's where our content fits. And also joining us on the show today, we have a double dose of special guest hosts. First off is Steve Sears. He is the president and COO over there at Option Solutions. You folks are probably also familiar with him from his book. He's the author of The Indomitable Investor, Why a Few Succeed in the Stock Market When Everyone Else Fails. He's also been the author for years of a column I'm sure many of you have read over the years called The Striking Price, a.k.a. one of the earliest options columns really around out there. Steve, welcome to the Advisor's Option. Great to be with you guys. And also joining us, he's a newcomer to the show and indeed to the network. He is Michael Oyster. He's the CIO over there at Options Solutions. He's also got a book in his back pocket. He's the author of Success in a Low-Return World. Michael, welcome to the Advisor's Option to you as well. Thank you, Mark. Happy to be here. And Michael, as we are wont to do with all of our first-timers, you know, Steve's been on, Matt's been on many times, but this is your first time on the network. Why don't you go ahead and give our audience a little bit of an overview of your background in the options and derivative space, as well as what it is you do day to day over there as the CIO of Option Solutions. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, Yeah, I guess I I started in the options business in 1994, working for a legendary options guy named Bernie Schaefer, who many of your listeners undoubtedly are familiar with. Uh, Bernie's a really bright options guy, got hooked up with him right out of college, and it was one of the best decisions I've ever made. Um, spent five years with him and then jumped ship and went to the institutional side of the world, uh, working for an institutional advisor and asset management firm known as Fund Evaluation Group. Uh, spent many years doing investment manager research, quantitative research, lots of statistical studies of markets and options, and advised clients on all things across their portfolio. Uh, and I was the options expert guy in that shop. So got to see a lot of options strategies come across my desk. Some that were really good and some that weren't so great. Uh, never really got out of options um, altogether. And then joined Options Solutions from inception as the chief investment officer. I am primarily charged with um, strategic direction and portfolio management for our clients. All right. We've got a great squad assembled. Let's kick it off. We added this segment's officially back on our 100th episode spectacular a few episodes ago. You folks all loved it. So we're going to keep it in the rotation. It is time for the P&L statement. What the heck happened in the options markets since our last episode? Let's find out with the P&L statement. All right, everyone, welcome to the P&L statement. You know, this segment really was born out of necessity, out of the dawn of the pandemic last year. It seems like we were always spending the top of the show each month, breaking down some of the madness that had unfolded from a volatility, from an options perspective over the course of the intervening month. I mean, of course, with the pandemic, it seemed like every month, every week, there was a new unprecedented event unfolding. So there was a lot to unpack. So it made sense to create a whole segment around this. Of course, on our last show, we were all talking about, you know, could the VIX really close substantially south of 20 and maintain that level for a while? Of course, fast forward a month and spoiler alert, it has. It is substantially south of 20 and has been for the better parts of pretty much most of the period since our last show there. So that question has at least been answered. Another question everyone was asking was, could the S&P really break through the 4,000 level and maintain it, close above it for any substantial period of time? And that question has already been answered substantially. We are well north of 4,100, actually closing in on 4,200 as of this show. So both of those questions, perhaps... Perhaps in the rearview mirror, but a lot to unpack nonetheless. Uh, Matt, we'll start with you. I know you spent a lot of time out there analyzing the volatility environment, looking at your various factors and models over there at ORATS. What has been lighting up your tape from a vol and indeed an options and market perspective since our last show, sir? Well, thanks, Mark. And you know me, I I like to look at those calls and see if they're still stratospheric. And they are, uh, you know, this Robin Hood effect is still uh, still there with uh, especially with the components of the, you know, in ORATS, we're able to look at the weighted average of, of many different components of the ETFs and the, the SPY, and IWM. And it's still, uh, you know, it, that has changed the skew market. It really has. It's we're we're still we still got that high uh, out of the money skew in there, even though that the number of calls have uh, traded have come down uh, a, a bit 
that, that's still quite uh, up there. Uh, we'll talk about earnings later, but the, the you know we look at the implied earnings effect. Uh, that's finally starting to come down, as we mentioned in a, in a different show. Uh, so you know it's been pumped up for so long, and and, and investors in uh, the straddles around earnings have not uh, really gotten a return on on their money, and now that's finally coming down. So those are the two biggest themes that I'm seeing right now, Mark. And Michael and Steve, same question for you. Either or both of you, feel free to chime in. Obviously, a lot has unfolded in the marketplace over the course of the past month. We're talking about volatility coming in, talking about markets, broad markets at least, continuing to rally the effect that Matt pointed out, what's been loosely dubbed the Robin Hood effect, all of these one-lot small retail customers piling into the calls and a variety of names really changing the skew. So a lot of things going on out there from an options and volatility perspective that are interesting to the advisors and asset managers out there. So maybe we'll start with Michael, if you have any thoughts there on on any of this that's been unfolding in the marketplace over the course of the last month, sir. Yeah, Mark, I, I certainly concur with what Matt is observing, and particularly as it pertains to the VIX, which, of course, is pricing the volatility of index options, having come down a lot. Um, I think the jury's still out, though, on whether we're entering into a, a, a different regime. The VIX spends many years in either high volatility regimes or low volatility regimes, like low volatility in the mid-90s and the early 2000s, and then uh, just a few years ago, 2014 to 2016. But then it makes these moves higher, like in 1998 and in 2008, and then more recently after the, the pandemic. Um, are we now entering into a new phase of volatility that's elevated relative to historical norms? I don't know. I think that's possible. Yeah, it's come down below 20 and certainly below the long-term averages now. Will it stay there? I don't know. I think we could very likely be in an environment where volatility remains elevated on an average basis for you know at least a few years. Speaking of VIX, Steve, you are a little bit familiar, passingly familiar, I would say, with VIX. I do believe somewhere in your Twitter bio, you refer to yourself as the VIX's, VIX's godfather out there. So what are your thoughts on this this evolution we're seeing in the ball space? And as Michael alluded to, that's kind of the big question everyone has on their minds right now. Are we headed for a new vol regime right now? What are your thoughts, sir? Well, I, I think that the, the Robin Hood effect is still at play. It's cooled a little bit from earlier in the year. We're obviously in the midst of earnings season, and so it's basically truth to consequence time uh, in the market. But I think that the screaming hot upside volatility in the calls is abating a little bit. And what you're seeing thus far is that the stocks are not rising as much as anticipated oftentimes uh, by the options market or even by stock investors when they report, and that's kind of pushing things around a little bit. I think it's too early to say that that we're entering into a low volatility regime because there's just too much. There, there are too many cross currents. You've got the $1.8 trillion American Families Act. You've got potential tax changes uh, to capital gains. And I think that will keep people a little bit on their, on, on their toes. But in terms of single stock vol, I still think that's really going to be where the where a lot of the focus and a lot of the action is, much more so even the, than the VIX. You know, many many years ago, I did coin the the phrase the fear gauge to describe the VIX and, and had, a, in my view, quite a bit of information that it telegraphed into the marketplace. I think the utility of the VIX is muted and has been for some time. And if you really want to sort of look at uh, evolve, it's oftentimes much more instructive just to look at a, at a single stock level and to try to intuit from there if you want to be a buyer or seller or put your calls. Well, since you're talking about single stock volatility, let's get into it. A little bit of the old earnings volatility report. Earnings announcements can move markets, but what is the options market telling us about upcoming earnings events? Let's find out with the earnings volatility report. All right, listeners, it's that time of year again. Earnings hot and heavy. This may, spoiler alert, this may indeed be a season where it actually drives a little volatility, may actually move things a little bit out there. You know, pretty much the discussion Matt and I have had for the better part of a year now going into every earnings season is this the one? Is this the cycle 
where people are going to start paying attention to earnings again, that guidance and announcements will actually matter and they will move stocks materially as a result. Because pretty much every cycle we process, and you can go to the optionsinsider.com, click on that options news and articles tab, go back to all of the old reports for every cycle over the course of the past year if you want to see the data for yourselves, pretty much every cycle has woefully, dramatically underperformed from an earnings vol perspective, usually on the order of 50 to 70% in terms of bang for your buck, how much movement you got versus how much was being priced in. So there's a lot weighing on this season. And Matt, it's a good time to be talking about this because it's a hot week. We got big names popping off, Tesla, Alphabet, Apple, Facebook, you know, names, Amazon, a few people may have heard of out there and actually want to trade. So I know when you're not doing a show like this, you and your team over there at Orat's busy crunching the numbers over there. What are your thoughts so far? And I did hear you make an interesting prediction last week on one of our other programs about perhaps what's in store for us for this season. I'm curious, are you still on that train, sir? Uh, it's getting harder to be on the train market. You know, we're, we're just not seeing <laughs> last not three seeing days. Moved. It's so hard to be. A, Did I not so, warn you? Did I not warn you on Friday? I said, yeah. watch out. You make that prediction, sir. It's easy I, to come I, back I, to bite. I jinxed it all. So we had a big move in Amgen uh, and, you know, a few, you know, Shopify and FFIV, they're all uh, they're all kicking in there. And so this is this is the big week, Mark. As we know, we break uh, earnings uh, weeks down into six weeks. And usually one and two are are not doing that well for uh, ret- big returns over uh, the implied valuations. But uh, weeks three, four, uh, five are the ones that we really hang our hat on. And so it's a little bit too early to tell. Today was good, uh, and we have some big ones coming out, as you say. So I'm I'm still. You know, even though a little bit more mild, I'm still on the on the uh, on the side uh, on, on the light side. On on we we have to get these long uh, straddle owners some money in their back pockets, Mark. And I think <laughs> this is the week to do it. And the implied the implied earnings moves are lower than we've seen in in many uh, many uh, earnings seasons. So that's going to help. Uh, but you know, this market. Is just you know I was listening to what Steve was saying about the single stocks and 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 uh, as opposed to the ETFs, but I was just looking at our our weighted average of of historical volat- volatilities and and everything's kind of down, uh, you know. So uh, it, it just uh, it, you know it it just feel you know as a market maker for a long time and and you could just feel the the volatility. You got to a point you know you were down there so long. And it, you know, and you were too, Mark. It just kind of feels like it's coming in. I don't know how it feels to you, but that's uh, showing not only in the uh, in the VIX and, and such, but also in, in the in the earnings arena. We're we're not seeing that that those big moves. But again, this is the week. So let's let's see, Mark. This is the big week. I was impressed last week when you went on that limb and made that early prediction i've been burned making that same prediction a few times over the course of the past year so i've backed off myself on diving into those this is it this is the one because it seemed like last cycle might have been shaping up that way as well and then it deeply disappointed everyone involved but we'll see you're right this is a big week we'll know for sure a lot of the fangs reporting this week they're of course big drivers of vol big drivers of the market so i think they will give us some indication of what to expect going further and of course uh steve and michael you guys were just talking about the impact of single name vol and how perhaps single name vol may be more relevant to have a little bit more data and more signal to it rather than noise versus the VIX. I'm curious for either of you two, have you been paying attention to earnings season and is earnings volatility something that factors into your analysis over there at Option Solutions? Yes, yeah, certainly paying very close attention to earnings and um, the impact that it has not only on the movement of the underlying stock, but the volatility of the options pricing. I mean, very few things on a month-to-month basis move a stock more than earnings do. Um, we typically try to structure positions in a way that provides us with a, a good understanding of the risks that we have on relative to when the earnings announcements are made. So uh, in aggregate, yes, there is a reason to believe that single stock volatility uh, is a greater storehouse of return potential when you're selling it as opposed to index option volatility. Um, and certainly how earnings plays into that uh, absolutely impacts how we put on positions. And, you know, one of those positions people like to put on these days, particularly in the advisor space, 
is the covered call. So it seemed like the perfect time to revisit it in our Options 101 segment. It's time to learn how to use options to manage risk and generate additional income for your clients. It's time for Options 101. All right, everybody, welcome to Options 101, the portion of the program where we break down an options concept or strategy or technique for you, the busy financial advisor. Maybe you've heard about it before. Maybe you're passingly familiar with it. Maybe this is the first time you're hearing about it. Either way, we'll walk you through it here on Options 101. And it seems like a lot of people have been talking to us lately on the network about the magic, the majesty of the covered call. It's a topic we've touched on many times here in the past on the advisor's option, but we haven't spent some time on it in a little while. And it seems like it is a very timely topic to address yet again for a variety of reasons. Rates are obviously anemic, so your traditional yield plays are really not delivering the way they used to. So clients out there right now are looking for additional sources of income, additional ways to generate that income. The covered call fits very nicely into that category. Of course, we're seeing some interesting valuations out there, some interesting volatility levels that always makes the covered call conversation a little bit more exciting as well. So again, we thought, what better topic to revisit here with Michael and Steve on the show than the covered call? Because they built an entire firm around it. Options Solutions is pretty much covered calls 24-7. So gentlemen, maybe I'll start with you before we get into the strategy itself. I'm curious. I'm sure a lot of our listeners are curious out there as well. Why the covered call? Why did you decide to focus your pretty much your entire firm and all of your efforts around this particular strategy? Look, it's a great question. We, we do more than just sell calls against long stock. One of the biggest challenges that most investors have, and most, most advisors are included in this, is they oftentimes don't know where to begin in, in integrating options into a stock portfolio. Now, the natural position of almost all investors is long. They, they buy stock because they, they think the, the value will increase. And what we believe and what we have found is that they also tend to take profits and they also look for ways to increase the returns of stalled or more of stocks. So one of the easiest, most classic ways to do that is to simply sell a call option against a stock that an investor owns. They understand it. It's a lot less complicated and a much more intuitive than some of the more esoteric uh, options positions. And so we sort of see it almost as the first step that an investor or advisor can take in the options market. And once they take that step and they begin to understand how options behave and how options can help them to generate income and reduce risk when used conservatively, which is what we do, it tends to lead to other types of strategies. And they, they realize that geez, I, I want to buy stocks below the market. I want to sell stocks above. I want to generate income and I want to reduce risk. Those are all very simple, classic investment goals that options can be used to, uh, to achieve. And, and unfortunately, there aren't a lot of people that are truly focused on it. People think of options and they think of the Robin Hood effect when we all know that that's really not the key way that, uh, that puts and calls should, should be used. Michael, same question for you. What is it that attracted you to the majesty of this comparatively straightforward strategy known as the covered call, sir? You know, the majesty is right. I mean, it's the, the most traditional kind of beginning point, as Steve said, for options. Wholeheartedly agree with, with Steve on all of those points. I would only add that covered call strategy is a, is a nice complement to what most investors have in their portfolio anyway, which is equity risk. Other options strategies... Um, can serve to magnify the equity risk where covered call writing complements it, provides a, a certain level of income. And I would even go further to say that when executed properly, provides an important level of discipline for an investor who may not know what to do after a stock has gone up. Um, and it provides them with a way of minimizing the behavioral biases that we all have that um, lead us sometimes to make bad investment decisions. 
I'm glad you guys both couched it in those terms as the beginner option tricks. That's something I've said for years. People always ask us on this network, you know, what is your ideal beginner options trade? What should people start doing when they trade options? Of course, we're all seeing now a lot of people are starting by buying out of the money calls and a variety of tech names. That would not be my go to for most people. I like you guys, I think a lot of people come to the options market with experience and exposure already in the equity market. So selling a covered call makes a heck of a lot of sense. It's a way to get an income stream from something they're already doing, placing limit orders on their stocks, and it's easy for them to wrap their heads around. So I've always been a big fan of the covered call as the perfect starter position. It's also easy for a lot of advisors to wrap their heads around and therefore for them to explain to their clients, which is also a big barrier to entry when it comes to options in the advisor space. Matt, I'd like your thoughts as well on this strategy, the covered call, and is it your favorite go-to beginner option strategy? Or do you perhaps prefer something else? Um, it's it's not my favorite, but I will tell. Uh, we've oh, I'm done sorry, six- I just hung up on you by accident. How did that happen, sir? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, actually, I like a, a short put spread for uh, you know, it's way out of the money for beginners. But we could talk about that later. Uh, but uh, you know, clearly, uh, uh, buy rights, cover calls, however you name it, are uh, super important, and and it does do all the things that w- that we're talking about. People are used to buying these stocks, but these stocks are so expensive these days too. So we did it. We did a huge test market it's on our blog, and and I'll send you the link to it. You know, stocks we we tested Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, and and about seven or eight others. Making uh, these stocks are making up about 30% of the S&P weighting. And we tested different days to expirations, 10, 15, 20, all the way up to 240. We, we tested different deltas, five to 50 every five delta. And we, in all, we ran like 3.5 million combinations of, of tests. You know, we, we measured things like uh, the stock, uh, the call price as a percentage of the stock price, the IV percentiles. Like, what are the important things to do and consider? Should we avoid earnings? Should we not avoid earnings? So uh, after the drum roll, uh, the best maturity of all those uh, we found to be 30 days. So that was pretty, that's pretty standard. And that's what a lot of people do. And we found the best delta was lower than we thought uh, is 10 delta. So very far out of the money. Not surprising with, you know, from we tested from 2007 to 2020 or, to, or 2020, I should say. And uh, so, uh, you know, the, obviously this, the market has gone up, so you're going to have a, a farther out of the money uh, uh, performing um, a little bit better. Avoiding earnings was better. So we, you want to avoid earnings because that's a lot of the times a, a lot of the big moves in the stocks are coming around earnings. Um, should you take a profit early or should you exit? Um, we, we found that holding to expiration was better. Um, and you should also... Uh, make sure that you get a uh, at least two percent of the stock price. So that's kind of hard to do with a ten delta, but so that's just showing you that uh, you, you're going to want to look at those, uh, you know, more expensive type uh, uh, um, stocks as ter- in terms of volatility. Um, the best, and, and then it also wants you to sell it in in a higher implied volatility percentile. Um, you know, when the when the percentile was above of 66. And we found that the puts call slope uh, wasn't that important. So that's a big, big test and some uh, valuable insights. These are what all the big boys do. You know, we, we represent a bunch of uh, pension funds and banks and stuff and such, but we put this, uh, we put this out there. I think it's on your site, it's on our site. So uh, uh, that's how we think about uh, cover calls, Mark. I like that 2%. That is a good goal for an aggressive goal <laughs> for a lot of people out there who are used to maybe selling covered calls for a few cents, probably when they probably shouldn't be selling the covered call. If you're still scratching your head saying, what the heck are these guys talking about? I'll break it down for a very quick example. If you want more detailed conversations, go back into the archives of this program, or of course, check out any of our educational programming options, boot camp, options, playbook, radio, both have extensive episodes devoted to the covered call. But basically, let's go back to everyone's favorite name. XYZ, we've all made and lost fortunes in XYZ. Let's see if we can make a fortune today or at least preserve some of it, get some yield off of it. XYZ trading around 100 bucks the way it usually is. Let's say you're along 1,000 shares and let's say 70, looking pretty good. 
<laughs> you got some gains in your pocket out there right now. So what should you do with that? A couple of things. You think, you know, maybe the stocks rally to 100 and now you think it's maybe petered out for a while. For the next few months, it's going to hover here around 100, not really do a lot. What can you do? A couple of different things. You can obviously take your money and run, close the position, take your $30 of profit and live to trade another day, go find something else. You could sit around, you know, do the crypto holdler thing and wait for the stock to rally again. Who knows how long that could take. Or your third option, maybe you want a little bit of income out there. You decide you could sell a covered call. You look at where the stock is right now. You decide, hey, you know, if it rallies another, let's say, 10 points to 110, I am very comfortable selling it at that level. So you turn around and sell, for the purposes of our example, a one-month covered call on the 110 strike. And you collect a dollar for it, which is a pretty hefty premium. Probably wouldn't get that much in the real world. But for our example, let's pay you a nice hefty $1 of premium. So, what? of course, you have 1,000 shares. Remember, the multiplier on your traditional equity options in an XYZ is 100. So you have to do 10 contracts to cover your full 1,000 shares. And so for the privilege of saying, hey, I will sell it at 110 if it gets there by expiration, you collect $1,000 just for being willing to say that. So now you see where the income portion of the trade comes in. Normally in an equity environment, you would say, hey, I I don't mind selling it at 110. I'm going to work a limit sell order at 110 and that's it. There is no income stream there. You are capping your gains after all, because if the stock gaps up, you're out at 110. So you should be compensated for some of that risk you're taking there. Because we all know leaving orders floating around out there these days, there is risk. You can have the next GameStop on your hands and you're missing out on that as a result. So you should be compensated for that. And in our example, you are. You are compensated $1,000 for that. And let's look at a couple of potential outcomes. So let's say XYZ stock stays below 110 really by expiration. So in the course of that month, it stays below 110. What happens? You keep the $1,000 and that's it. You live to fight another day. You can do it again the next month, sell it at that same strike. If the stock drops, you can sell it at a lower strike, whatever you decide to do, but you keep that $1,000 in premium. Nothing happens. If the stock rallies above and closes above 110 at expiration, then you sell your stock at 110. Plus, remember, you collected $1 to sell the option, so you effectively sell your stock at the strike price of $111. No matter where the stock is, if it's trading $5,000, you're still selling it at $111. So that's why you're being rewarded for that. You are capping any theoretical upside that is there in the stock. So this is a very attractive trade for a lot of people out there for a variety of reasons. Obviously, Michael and Steve are big fans of this as well. So let's get into that a little bit. You guys out there at Option Solutions, Spend your days when you're not talking to me, constructing covered call portfolios and setting up your covered calls. We just heard Matt break down some interesting findings he had from his back tests on covered calls. Uh, I'm curious for you guys, how do you approach this position? What is your optimal setup, your optimal strategy, your optimal structure for a covered call? I, I was you go ahead. to hear Matt's results from his research because it it aligns very well with with how we position things for our clients when we put things on um we tend to stay about 40 or 30 to 45 days until expiration um 10 to 20 delta but it really depends and an important aspect of this that we run into with our client relationships is does the client want to sell the stock or not and if they don't want to sell the stock it's generally a better idea to keep the deltas low that way you don't have to roll up and out to avoid an assignment situation. If the stock moves up, you may get the stock called away when you least expect it. And um, that can be a, a sticky situation. So yes, we, we look at um, pretty far out of the money positions to start with in most cases. Um, and then again, one of the things that, that you talked about, Mark, in your example was, you know, you put in this limit order at 110. We think it's a really important aspect of all of investing to operate with a a demonstrated attention to discipline. And if the stock goes from 100 to 110, who knows, maybe there was a positive news story. Maybe there was something else that made you rethink now, maybe I'd like to keep this stock. Well, if you've got that limit order out there, you're selling the stock at 110. And in most cases, that's probably a really good thing. Yeah, the the, the one thing that, that, that I would add is I think that all of us who do this for a living have a general we all generally kind of agree on the, on, on the framework and it's the application of, of that work. It, it varies. And, you know, the, the pension funds really aren't like our RIAs in, in my view or, or high net worth investors or people trying to use options to better navigate the market. Those, those 
investors tend to be a, a little bit more systematic. They tend to be a little bit more disciplined, and they're doing certain things for certain very sort of specific reasons. What we found in these sort of a client-driven engagements where you're using options to optimize um, a portfolio or to accomplish something is that it, it helps – for people to think about the options uh, premium as, as something that we call a conditional dividend. And, and the, the dividend doesn't, frankly, in my view, get the, the, uh, the respect that it, that it deserves. So if you look at historical stock returns, dividends are like 45% or so of that, of that return. So a way to think about options selling strategies, including the covered call or the cash secured put or the put spread, is can you generate premium that equals to or exceeds that of the dividend? And a lot of people grasp that immediately. And, you know, it was Larry McMillan who years ago introduced the rule that when you sell an option, try to get a dollar for it. Now we express it more as a percentage of the, uh, of the underlying. But, you know, we have found that, that this conditional dividend approach is something that enables people to understand the strategies even more and it gives them a way to sort of to sort of measure what they're doing against something that they already understand. I like the idea of approaching that's that's the way I've always termed it when I approach of new people is think of it as constructing your own dividend income stream on whatever stock you want. That's usually an attractive prospect. I know a lot of advisors like to approach it in that terminology as well, because that's very attractive to a lot of particularly clients who are coming to an asset manager or an advisor looking to protect some retirement gains, looking for a little bit of extra yield, as long as you can explain in the conversation that it isn't actually a dividend. It's not quite the same thing, but it's an approximate thing. As long as you understand the differences, I think that's a, that's a great way to start the conversation, particularly with a client who may be reticent when you mention the options were. They get a little bit scared. You talk about a dividend stream, that's a little bit more palatable uh, to a lot of them. But, Michael, you touched on something which is interesting, I know, for a lot of the audience, this program in particular as well. A lot of them have clients who come to them, and they have large, concentrated positions in a single stock, which is ideal usually for a covered call type scenario. But also, maybe they're an executive at the company, or maybe they don't want to take the tax hit. So now you're, you're talking about a little bit of a different thing. This is a client who may want the income stream, but doesn't really or can't take the, can't actually sell the underlying. What do you do when a client like that comes to you? How do you alter your approach? Yeah, I think the first most important thing is to manage expectations right up front. And Steve described it well. That's how we think about it. Um, you know, we're not going to make them rich beyond the dreams of avarice. Uh, by selling additional call income on the stock that they already own. But if we look at it and say this is an incremental uh, return stream, that's attractive, and particularly in an environment where interest rates are so low. Um, you know, we, we're challenged every day to look for things that can provide income for one reason or another, whether it be a, an individual in retirement or uh, a pension plan that needs to meet an actuarial goal. Um, so options provide that that really interesting opportunity to you know to generate additional incremental income. Um, one additional thing is that there are options, as you guys know, um, that can be constructed in the flex markets that are not American but rather European, which is to say there's no risk of early exercise. In some instances, that may be a situation where if a client absolutely positively cannot sell the stock. Um, let's take that risk off the table. There's a cost associated with that. We recognize that. Um, but that's another tool in our, in our toolbox. Do you guys create a lot of flex options for your covered call clients? Um, I'd say it's a, it's a percentage, maybe 10% of the time that we do that. We, we try to avoid it again because, as you might imagine, there's a haircut associated with, with selling those options. You're taking away the right that the option owner would have to exercise that option before expiration. Um, when you do that, there's a cost associated with that. So we generally try to manage the expectations. And if the client is able to sell some stock, you know, in, in many cases, that can be uh, an opportune thing to do. But, you know, it's, it's sort of the last uh, ditch effort to ensure that absolutely no way does the stock get sold. Well, Matt, we got to spend hours talking about the myriad different permutations of the covered call, but I kind of want to just revisit it right now because I know this is a strategy that is indeed on the tips of the tongues of many people 
out there right now. So before we wrap up, any final thoughts you may have on the pros and or cons of the covered call, as well as, you know, we touched on in the past, didn't get a chance to really get into them here, but the many different upgrades or tweaks you could do to the covered call. We're talking about the collar, which I've said many times is kind of the holy grail position. For many advisors out there, you may be selling a covered call vertical as opposed to just a call. Or as our friend Brian over there on Options Playbook Radio likes to do the fig leaf, which is doing a stock substitution, then selling a quasi-covered call against it. There's a lot of different ways you could play with your covered call. So any thoughts on those tweaks as well, sir? You know, after so many years, uh, and I actually started in the 80s in the financial uh, markets and was listening to my... uh, Parents and grandfather talk about the markets in the 70s and stagflation. So I'm older than a lot of you guys. But, you know, the stocks do go down every once in a while. And, you know, we're all looking at the cover calls, look at the upside. And, and uh, you know, but there are protection plays that you could you could do and get that I think are important, especially if you're getting some cover call premium. You, it, it often can sponsor uh, buying a put or buying a put spread. So you could have a you know, kind of a collar, or you could have a put spread collar on uh, for for low or or very uh, little cost or no cost, and exactly selling selling a call spread. Often, you could participate, uh, and there's some very cheap uh, calls out there. Um, what we like to do is is uh, you know we have uh, a theoretical values all the time, so we'll put on a diagonal where we'll sell one and buy another one, and a lot of times you don't have the the complete loss if, if the if the uh, stock goes up really quickly, and then of course on the downside you can find some and structure some uh, put spreads or, or even way out of the money puts where the drag is not that much, and so you 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 might be long a uh, you know a one year or two year put and short calls. Um, and, and then there's also some tax benefits as, as well. But uh, you know if if you're uh, losing money on the calls uh, by uh, getting them call, called away, uh, you know that could qualify uh, as short term. Uh, and also, uh, if you are uh, protected when when that market starts turning downward, you know all of these types of things are going to uh, help your sharp ratio. So th- I, I just ran a quick back test on Apple uh, selling that twenty. Uh, or that 30-day, uh, 10 to 20 delta call, and and even selling just the call uh, inc- improves your sharp ratio. So it reduces your volatility. So that's another uh, benefit to investors using overrides is that you can you know reduce a lot of the the uh, the volatility of your holdings. So uh, those are those are the types of things I think about, Mark, when we're talking about cover calls, some protection, and how to use them, and and what other benefits they provide. Improving the sharp ratio, magic words to many of the advisors out there. Their ears just perked up when you said that, Matt. Well, Michael and Steve, same question for you. We could talk about covered calls for many hours here, but we have some other segments to hit on before we wrap up here. But really quickly, some final thoughts on you know the pros and cons of the covered call, as well as what are your thoughts on maybe the utility or perhaps lack thereof of some of these upgrades we see out there, the tweaks in the covered call realm, whether it's selling verticals because you're worried about maybe the stock continuing to rally or perhaps using some of that call premium to buy a put, getting into a collar, getting into you know a stock substitution with a covered call, quasi-covered call really against. There's a lot of ways you can play with the covered call. So which of these variations or permutations do you guys like yeah and i just back to your earlier question mark the i think we covered it pretty well about covered call writing it's it's about generating incremental income there's a risk buffer to the downside of course the stock will go down and still goes down but you do have that, that risk buffer in terms of the other strategies I, I one of the many reasons why i love options is that options are like the swiss army knife of investing you know, you, you kind of know what you're going to get with a stock. You kind of know what you're going to get with a bond. But you can't paint options into one particular corner. There's so many different things you can do. They're malleable. You can ex- you can execute on really any kind of risk return uh, profile that you're trying to achieve in the marketplace with options. So, yeah, I think with a lot of those kinds of strategies, it just depends upon what your view is. And it's not just a directional view. It's the time it takes for that direction to play out. 
that's what options are so great with. You can you can you can decide what you believe is going to happen in the marketplace, and you can put on a position. Um, so generally, we're 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 staying on the conservative side of things. We generally don't take a great deal of risk. We don't um, we're, we're not looking at leverage or anything like that for our clients. So we're we're certainly on the more conservative end of things. But I do have a great deal of respect for those who put on some of these more esoteric strategies. Steve, same question for you. Any final thoughts on the covered call before we keep rolling, sir? I mean, I was always taught just to apply the, uh, the KISS principle and keep it simple. And that's always been my uh, my discipline. And I think when you do keep it simple and you keep it conservative and grounded, the outcomes tend to be pretty good. If you get a little funkier, um, it's intellectually attractive to all of us. We sort of everyone sort of likes the excitement and the and, and the complications that come along with it, but I'm not sure if they, over time if they really do any better than just simply sometimes selling a call and selling a put. All right, now it's time for us to keep moving into our next segment. It is time to get the buzz. Busy financial advisors and asset managers don't have time to follow the latest developments from the world of options. So we do it for you. It's time to get the buzz. All right, everybody. Time to get the buzz and let's kick it off. It is OIC time, options industry conference time. This is usually a time of year where I am at some location scattered across the U.S. here, locked in a room, having great conversations with a slew of different people from throughout the options industry, exchanges, brokers, vendors, traders, all, you name it, all of the above, to bring you a great cross-section of what's going on in the world of options. The conference is going on right now as we speak. It's virtual this year, so There's no in-person event, so we're bringing you our best approximation of it. Stay tuned to the network for a lot of great interviews. Already a couple hit you yesterday, more to come in the days and weeks to come. But one of the big topics at OIC and indeed in the options market right now and indeed coming into this year was, was 2020 an anomaly? Was it just an outlier year because of the pandemic? And once the pandemic started to curtail here in the U.S., we had vaccines, people started getting back to work, would volume fall off. Well, so far, at least, numbers seem to be saying no. We have the numbers now for March. We're close to have the numbers for April, March, the busiest options month in the history of the options market. 904 million contracts coming out of our friends over there at OCC. It's up nearly 35% from an already busy March of 2020. Again, it's the highest volume month in the history of the options business. In fact, if you look at this year so far, you have March is number one, January is number two for all-time records, and February is number three. I believe December is even number four. So you're talking about a nice, almost straight linear progression throughout the end of last year into this year of options volume continuing to explode. So the million-dollar question now is, is, what's going on? Is this the beginning of a new trend, that this is kind of the new normal from an options perspective, can this party continue? We're also seeing some interesting data coming out of places like Bloomberg showing what Matt was talking about earlier with this, the Robin Hood effect, aka the frenzy of call love. The way they look at it at Bloomberg, they say the call volume is actually starting to moderate out there. So there's a lot of different takes on it. Overall volume exploding. Is it still as aggressive in the calls? I know, Matt, maybe we'll start with you because you said at the top of the show, you think the Robin Hood effect is still firmly in effect right now. So what are your thoughts on these yet another record month coming out of OCC, as well as what you're thinking we're in store for in the months to come, sir? Yeah, it's it's uh, been interesting because we talk to a lot of clients. You know, I'm having three to five presentations, demos, discussions a day. Uh, some of the people, you know, more of the individuals are saying, yeah, I'm, I'm locked in. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking for something to do. I've had a couple of those conversations. So it's pretty funny. So I'm sure it's out there where, uh, and once the lockdowns end, we're, we're going to have fewer of those, uh, YOLO, uh, traders and, and calls. But, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of this, uh, trading, you know, people are learning about options. And, and as we found in the Cirilli study, um, a year or two back, Mark, when, when people start to, uh, understand trading by trading in their personal accounts, they bring it to their firms and make businesses and such around it. And, and I, uh, we support, um, a, a lot of firms making platforms 
and I'm getting a lot more student interest. So uh, there's something that, you know, what you're doing here at Option Insider, OCC, you know, Option Solutions, it's really been uh, neat to to uh, to meet Option Solutions. And, and is it Bill Speth? Is he over there too? Wow, you guys have, you guys have everybody. So I think everyone's work uh, coupled together is just making options uh, more accessible and people understanding it better and, and leading to these big volume spikes, Mark. Yeah, rising tide certainly does lift all boats. Michael and Steve, you've both been around the option space for a while. What are your thoughts on these continued records coming out of OCC from an overall volume perspective, as well as what are your thoughts on whether this party can continue? Maybe, Steve, we'll start with you. I think the, the party definitely can not continue. You know, if you look at, go back all the way back to 2000, if a million contracts traded amongst the five markets back then, it was a huge day. But, you know, now the volumes are surging. And I think something that has happened over the past decade that's been extremely important, investors have realized that volatility is something that you can and should manage. And oftentimes the best way to do that is simply um, with puts and calls. And so I think we've seen massive amounts of investors realize that the options, frankly, are are no longer optional. Uh, It's like the pension funds that were mentioned earlier all the way down to the family offices, all the way down to John and Jane Investor. So the volumes, of course, are going to add. There's a seasonality to the marketplace. But I think going forward, you're going to see them continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger, especially as people realize that the old 60-40 way of reducing risk in portfolios just simply doesn't work the, the same way that it once did. Michael, same question for you, sir. Can the party continue here in 2021, sir? Yeah, absolutely. I, I can't add anything to that. That was too good. Options are not optional anymore. That's that's the long and short of it. <laughs> there you go. A new tagline for your firm. And Matt, speaking of firms, I know you guys have been busy over there at Orats, cranking away a lot of interesting new things that are very buzzworthy as well. And you know, you always had the back testing and a lot of the other cool functionality, the earnings data reports, but now cranking away on some new things. That may be interesting to our audience, including, of course, some paper trading, which I know a lot of people who are coming to the world of options, maybe they're talking today about covered calls, and that's all new to them. Maybe they want to start on the paper trading side. Certainly an interesting way to go, as well as perhaps taking it out of their hands completely with auto trading, sir. Why don't you catch us up on those two developments? Well, I'm, I'm busy writing down all of Michael's quotes. You know, I, I love options that aren't optional anymore and the avarice. I mean, um, uh, this, this has been uh, exceptional. You're going to have some great quotes going forward for the Option Insider, Mark. So I met the ball uh, yeah, 102 of them, uh, yes. Uh, one of the things that we, we we like to do, especially for clients that are uh, you know just starting out, you know we put a, a paper trading uh, systems together so they can uh, see their rules based approach and when, and it, it gives them alerts and uh, they could see how the performance is actually uh, happening in the market. And we we've written our own paper trading, so we we simulate fills, you know, certain amount of slippage and commissions that you could put in. And there's some randomness involved just based on our expertise on, on where you're getting filled. So people could start to get the uh, the, the uh, feeling for running a, 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 um, an option strategy that, that's, that's more systematic and, and, and rules-based. And then what you could do is overlay those, uh, those types of, of profits on your back tests and see that that you're keeping consistent with what your expectations were. So, you know, one of the things that we're uh, you know, kind of bringing about with all our back testing now is is more auto trading and then paper trading those, and then eventually, you know, uh, get into uh, automated trading. You know, people don't have as much time. You could you could go a long way to help them uh, implement these strategies. You know, a lot of times they're doing something else, but if they're getting a, an email automatically uh, of the positions and strategies that they have. It's a lot easier. So we're bringing that to our clients, and, and we've uh, got a lot of really good feedback on that, Mark. Speaking of feedback, we're coming up against it, but I, I want to at least squeeze in one of our listeners. So let's do a real quick office hours. It's time to answer your pressing questions about options. It's time to start our office hours. You can become a part of this segment by leaving a question on the optionsinsider.com, emailing us at questions at the optionsinsider.com, or via social media at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider 
or stocktwits.com slash options insider. All right. I couldn't leave without squeezing in this question from Elisa Marquez because it, it fits so nicely. It dovetails so well with our conversation from this episode. She writes, I tend to prefer quarterly covered calls for my accounts because it lines up much closer with my other portfolio objectives. I know many advisors feel the same way. I've heard you mention on your network that your preferred way to sell covered calls is typically shorter term. Why is that? Is there some way to improve upon my traditional quarterly covered call portfolio with the proviso that the time for daily options position management is limited? Yeah, this is a very frequent concern we hear from a lot of advisors that they don't really have time. As I mentioned at the top of the show, you're busy out there dealing with clients, probably feeling a lot of calls these days because these markets are pretty topsy-turvy. So the notion that you could be out there like your typical active market maker or active retail trader managing each of your covered call portfolios, probably not going to be in your wheelhouse from a time perspective. So the quarterly covered call is a popular alternative for a lot of advisors out there, kind of the set it and forget it approach. I'm curious, let's start with you guys, uh, Steve and Michael, because you hang your hats out there in the covered call land. What do you have to say for Elisa and other advisors out there who are in a similar situation where they don't feel they have the time to write, you know, let's say, a weekly option, so they go for the quarterly route instead, and, and maybe what are they missing as a result, if anything? Well, I, I think that in, these are the certain instances in which it pays to work with a specialist, and a lot of times people like to focus on options that expire in a month or less because they want to harness what's called time decay, which is the phenomenon of an option losing a little bit of value each day. There have been a number of studies that have been done over the years that show that selling shorter dated options produces a higher income than selling a three-month option. Historically, the three-month expiration was known as the the buy-right market or the covered call market, and that's changed in the past 10 years or so as weeklies have become increasingly popular. So if you look at the options market, which has roughly 4,000 different uh, options classes, the vast majority of options liquidity is now focused within the front month or 30 days out. That is kind of the the factor we're seeing out there. That's why we have traditionally in the past recommended nearer dated covered calls because of that factor you just mentioned, of course, maximizing your theta, aka your time decay. You want to capture as much of it as possible in an option writing strategy like this and the covered call three months out doesn't really maximize that theta. Uh, Matt, any thoughts here for Elisa and all the other advisors out there who are probably in a similar boat saying, yeah, you know, I I don't have that much time, so I write it once a quarter, and that's kind of it. Set it and forget it for me. Well, uh, she asked why we we do this, and and it's it's merely just that's what tests the best. And and as Steve says, you know, that you have the, the optimal time for that theta, is generally shorter than a, a quarterly, and you know, like uh, she's she's saying that she doesn't have that many, that much time. But you have, you know, companies like Option Solutions that could help out, and you have, you know, my firm that could give automa- automated alerts, and so you know that might help that because you want to be selling uh, options and, and and performing option strategies that make sense. Uh, just on their face rather than how much time you have. <laughs> but, you know, of course, it's, it's, all, uh, it's all important. But, you know, you want to try, try to overcome that with technology or with a service provider if possible, Mark. Speaking of time, we are unfortunately out of ours. But before we go here on the advisor's option, let's go back around the horn, check in with everyone, see what they have cooking that may interest you. Michael and Steve, We'll start with you guys. If our listeners are intrigued, they've been listening to you all episode talk about covered calls. They want to contact you to learn more about what it is you guys do. Where should they go? What should they do? You know, we have our, our website is optionsolutions.com, and anybody can, you know, should feel free to, to email either of us uh, on ssears at optionssolutions.com. Those two S's in the middle, and Michael, of course, is M. Oyster. That's the same. Happy to talk and help anyone who's a. Uh, uh, who's interested. There you go. Optionssolutions.com for our conversation today. Piqued your interest. Check them out. Optionssolution.com. And Matt, where should folks go? They want to check out earnings data, do some back tests, auto trading, paper. 
what don't you guys do it? Can you rotate my tires at Orats now, sir? Uh, the latest thing that we're doing, Mark, has uh, is, is been really fun. We've been, uh, you know, when we identify a good option strategy, now we're trying to find the timing. So we're using, we have all this uh, historical data, skew data, delta I, IVs and, and uh, contangos and correlations. And we're using all that to try to time certain strategies. So that's been a lot of fun. Uh, machine learning and, and all that. So that's our latest thing. And, uh, you know, in addition to the auto trading, paper trading alert system. So there's a lot going on. ORATS.com, O-R-A-T-S.com, Option Research and Technology Solutions, it stands for. And uh, I'm Matt at ORATS. So uh, come on over. Come on over, ORATS.com. You know where to go to learn more about the OIC has cooking, optionseducation.org. Great educational content there. Uncovered calls and many other topics. And of course, on behalf of our friends over there at OCC, as well as Michael and Steve, and of course, Matt and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for listening live, for sending in your questions. Keep them coming. We love to hear from all of you. Remember, keep tuning in throughout the rest of the week. We, of course, have our double dose of Education Wednesday still to come today. Options Boot Camp, Options Playbook Radio still coming at you. There's a lot more content coming today, tomorrow. Of course, we have TWIFO this week in Futures Options, as well as Episode 2 of the Option Block, Friday Volatility Views. And then it all kicks off again with another month and another episode of the advisor's option the advisor's option is brought to you by the options industry council the oic was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange traded equity options for more information on how the oic can help you implement options in your practice please visit optionseducation.org the Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop options strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end -end option strategy development, making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning, options data, including dividends and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.